Well, welcome out, folks. Um, okay, I guess being recorded. Um, make sure I'm unmuted. Okay, so I think we're good to good to go. Great. So um, here to talk to you about the CNO Canal and what I call the secrets of the CNO Canal. Those little known stories about the canal. Now, my first book, historical fiction book, was about the CNO Canal during the Civil War. Um, it's what got me into writing about history, the canal. And then um, that turned into a trilogy. And I've actually, uh, and then maybe four years ago, I did Secrets of the CNO Canal, which is nonfiction. Um, so the, the stories I'm going to tell you today or talk to you about today are stories from that book, uh, condensed a little bit in many cases. So make sure this works. Perfect. So before construction could even start on um, George Washington's Potomac Company, which was the forerunner to the CNO Canal, the Maryland and Virginia had to work out issues concerning the Potomac River. Um, Maryland's 1632 grant gave the state control of the entire river. They had uh, to the Southern Bank, they owned that property that was part of Maryland. Uh, but it also had a clause in there that Virginia should be given free navigation and use of the river. So there had to be some issues worked out between the two governments for that canal that, um, that George Washington was planning uh, could be built. It needed some river modifications, uh, including locks and some dams and those sorts of improvements kind of fell into a gray area of the charter. So in 1785, both sides, <clears throat> they agreed to meet and work out these issues, talk these issues out. They elected or appointed delegations and selected a place and meeting time. And on during a heavy snowstorm on March 20th, 1785, the Maryland commissioners who were made up of Samuel Chase, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer Tom, and Thomas Stone arrived at a tavern in Alexandria for this meeting. There was no Virginia delegation. Uh, there had been some cross communications. Um, some of the commissioners that Virginia had appointed hadn't even known they were appointed. Uh, there was one, um, one of the commissioners was George Mason. Now he happened to meet the Maryland delegation who were on their way to the, to this meeting or expected meeting. And he had just found out that he was, had been appointed the commissioner. He hadn't had time to make arrangements to be at the meeting. So, but, um, so he kind of let them know what was happening. So this first meeting did not happen, but um, George Washington being the diplomat he was and kind of embarrassed, whoops, embarrassed by what had happened, he offered Mount Vernon. Why does that keep happening? He offered Mount Vernon as a meeting place. And so, um, the following year, the, the two delegations gathered there. Uh, he wined and dined them. They talked out their, their issues. And um, they came to not only agreements about the issues that needed to be resolved for the Potomac Company to operate, but they also talked about other issues of, um, of interest or concerning the river things like fishing rights and uh, what else was there? Fishing rights and tariffs. And uh, they made agreements on should 
uh, to make the river continue to make it navigable, uh, a cost sharing plan, things like that. And it was so productive that they said, hey, this would be a great way for the states to work out the issues that they have, that they need to resolve between uh, states. So they called for a meeting in 1787 in Annapolis and all the states were to appoint delegations and send them there. And they were gonna talk out kind of like they did here at Mount Vernon. And um, so that meeting rolled around, only five states had delegations show up. Uh, some, couple of them were actually en route. They got there too late. Uh, apparently a few others did not appoint delegations for one reason or another. But the five groups that were there and the ones that showed up late, uh, they did not constitute a majority of the states. So they really couldn't make anything binding among all states, but they had discussions and found common ground and they decided that, hey, this is, it, it was productive enough that it's worth another try. So they agreed to meet again. This time they met in Philadelphia for what became the first constitutional Congress. So, um, the CNO Canal actually helped establish, literally established the American government. And here's Washington at, uh, this would have been the second Constitutional Congress because oddly enough, he was not invited to the first. He was not in the delegation, though he'd been a big proponent of everything. So, <clears throat> You'll often hear, and it's even in the name of the canal, that the destination, the ultimate destination of the CNO Canal was the Ohio River, the O in CNO. However, it was someplace even further away, Lake Erie. As they were starting to, well, when Lake Erie first opened, um, it allowed for transportation to happen uh, between Buffalo, New York and Albany, 363 miles of which um, I think it was 163 were canal miles. So once that was opened up, it was an immediate success for, for trade and transportation up there. That got people thinking down this way uh, that they needed something similar. Uh, they also were quite aware that with the Erie Canal allowing trade up north to push further into the west, they were losing business. Uh, the merchants were losing business uh, to the northern route. And so they started thinking about what they could do down here. They called a convention in Baltimore. Uh, it was called the Convention for the Promotion of internal improvement. And it was all about how to capitalize in the mid-Atlantic states on the canal, on a canal. And so they were excited about it. Interestingly enough, the president of this convention was Charles Carroll of Maryland. One at that time, at one time, one of the richest men, or some people say the richest man in the country. So they met, they discussed, um, they decided that they wanted a canal. And their plan for the canal was to have it go west from Baltimore to Frederick County where it would connect with the Potomac River, pretty much follow the existing or the uh, what would become the CNO Canal route from Frederick County out to Cumberland and then continue on up there uh, to Pittsburgh and the headwaters of the Ohio River. However, they weren't planning to go to the Ohio. From Pittsburgh, they were going to turn north 
and go to Lake Erie. Uh, they would, they, their plan was to tap into Lake Erie about 200 miles uh, southwest of where the Erie Canal was coming into the lake. So they figured that um, the Erie Canal would still capture the trade north of the Erie Canal and a little bit south, but this new proposed canal that they were thinking of would capture trade that was intended uh, somewhat north of where they were going to hit the canal and further west. So they thought they were essentially going to step in and kind of uh, cut the Erie Canal out of business. However, this was a quite um, ambitious project. The canal as proposed would have been 510 miles long. Uh, so very long. Uh, what's that? That's almost three times longer than the canal is today. But this, uh, this convention, they endorsed the project. Uh, they thought it was worthwhile pursuing. Um, they were running numbers of how much money they would bring in. And then they happened to run the numbers of how much this project would cost them. <clears throat> the estimate was $22 million. At the time, um, well, Nowadays, that would be about $650 million. So a pretty uh, daunting project for them. Um, they just kind of balked at that price. Then they started scaling back plans. And that's how you eventually wound up settling into the existing CNO canal route, which was estimated when it started that it would only cost four and a half million. So still a lot of money, but they had the backing of the federal government by then. So, uh, yeah, so it could have been, I guess, the C&E Canal initially if it had been built that way. And I don't think so many people would be biking and hiking it today, quite, quite arduous. By the way, this is a shot of the Erie Canal up, um, in New York. So with the construction of the canal, the CNO canal, people started thinking, you know, again, the merchants are like, okay, how can we get a piece of this? How can we expand our reach to get to more markets? And so there were three proposals for add-on canals, I guess you would call them. The first one, which you can see here, uh, was the Washington City Canal. It was actually built and was operating before the CNO Canal broke ground. It was, uh, it's just two, two and a quarter miles long, and it passed through Washington City, connecting the Anacostia with the Potomac. It was originally created to try and capitalize on George Washington's Potomac Company business and to bring trade from the Anacostia into the Potomac where then it could go through, uh, through the locks that Washington had designed to move upriver or vice versa. So um, this canal uh, was done by a lottery uh, had to do a couple lotteries before they finally raised enough money, uh, which delayed it. And by the time they finally got it working and operating, Washington's Potomac Company had closed. But still, it was able to bring trade through the city. Uh, here's a map. You can kind of see the path that the canal is going along the top. Then it makes those 90 degree cuts, then diagonal, and then it splits off to go into two other areas. So, um, so it was built, uh, capitalized with $100,000 at the time, uh, finally broke ground in 1810. <clears throat> so it was in that period between 
the closure of the Potomac Company, and the opening and groundbreaking of the CNO Canal. Uh, it started at the Anacostia near the Washington Navy Yard, uh, moved north and northwest um, through town until it uh, you know, went back into the Potomac. Now, they did use it once the CNO Canal started, but there were a lot of problems with it. Uh, this canal suffered from tidal shifts to the water. So it was hard to keep the water at a consistent level in the canal for it to operate. So you had to time your traffic with the tides. And those tidal shifts also caused another problem, bringing in sediment, which filled up the canal, which made it, um, again, harder for any boats that uh, drew a significant draft to pass through the canal. You could only uh, draw a three foot draft, which meant you weren't, it wasn't gonna be a really big boat that could go through the canal. But it did operate. Um, and then they, uh, <clears throat> once it sort of became part of the CNO canal, it also, um, they built a lock house in Washington city. It is at Constitution Avenue and 17th Street. And it's still there, although the canal no longer is there. So you don't have to wonder. Uh, I'm sure many people wonder why there's a lock house and no lock or canal. Um, and that's because uh, another one of the problems they ran into, once canal traffic started, or the canal era started to pass and Railroads became the big thing for transportation. Traffic starts dropping off on this canal. It's already a little canal, not super profitable. So it wound up closing, shop, cl closing up shop. Uh, now they did keep it open, keep it watered. Um, although that caused problems keeping it watered because uh, number one, the tidal shifts if there was a heavy tidal shift with a storm or something, uh, it contributed to flooding in the town. But the more, the larger reason that it caused a problem is people started using it to dump all their trash. It was their, their sanitation place. So you go out and, uh, I mean, it wasn't unusual for that time. A lot of people use the Potomac River for that too. The idea you dump your trash, dump your, your refuge, gets carried away out of sight, out of mind. Um, but apparently it wasn't getting carried away so much in this canal. And so it was really stinking up the city. Imagine open sewer line just running through the city. And that's what it was. Um, so that by 1871, um, residents had had enough and they um, petitioned the city and the city bought up the property and filled it in. And now you've got roads through that area instead of canal. The second canal, spinoff canal, was called the Alexandria Canal. Um, once the construction of the CNO started, um, merchants in Alexandria, they were pretty excited. Uh, they were thinking, you know, hey, we're gonna get all this Western traffic, uh, coal traffic, and other stuff coming down. Uh, they thought it would be a big economic boon for them. They uh, subscribed quarter million dollars to the construction of the canal. So then the canal opens, traffic starts, and they're realizing most of this traffic coming down is not coming to their side of the river. It's coming down to Georgetown. So they're pretty upset about that, but they had a condition with their subscription uh, a clause that said they could exercise an option to build their own little canal to connect to the mainline CNO canal, which they decided to do. Um, and they did that in 1830. So about, um, you know, three years after the canal had really started operating, uh, at least the lower end of the canal had started operating enough for them to see that they were losing out. So their canal 
broke ground in on July 4th, 1831. Uh, the big catch was how they were going to connect to the CNO on the opposite side of the river. There were suggestions about having a, a lock that would let boats into the river so they could be towed across to be let into this Alexandria Canal. Uh, they eventually, though, decided to build a big aqueduct across the river to carry the boats. Um, now, their initial estimate to build this canal was $200,000, just over $200,000. It was going to be a seven and a quarter mile long canal. But that aqueduct, that ran their cost way up. So um, it the uh, ending cost was 600,000. So quite a bit more than they had planned, but um, they built it. It was uh, quite popular in its time, had six, uh, stone abutments spanning the river and um, they were 21 feet across or 21 feet wide and uh, it carried boats there was a lock house that would let the boats into the aqueduct they would then um, continue across the river go right into the alexandria canal and come down to this alexandria wharfs which you can see on the left-hand side. That is that left-hand picture. So this worked for a while, um, but then of course you had that little thing called the Civil War and uh, Alexandria and DC wound up on different sides. So they shut that canal down or they shut the aqueduct down. Uh, the army was guarding it uh, so that it could only be used to transport union stuff across to the occupied area of Alexandria. Um, but then even that was drained and then they used it as a, a wagon road to get wagons across uh, the river. Now, after the war, there was talk about reopening it, but there was uh, damage had been done to it. So it was gonna bring in more cost. And of course, Alexandria and Virginia having just come through the war, they didn't have the money to do it. so a lot of hemming and hawing, um, trying to get somebody else to pay for it. Um, but they did eventually, um, you know, through bits and pieces from merchants and government, they did get it operating for a short time. Uh, but then it wasn't, they were discovering by now canals weren't profitable. And so the, uh, the city fathers of Alexandria made a deal with the Alexandria Railroad and Bridge Company, and they leased the canal uh, bed and the canal towpath to the company, and they used it for their uh, trolley lines for years. So you could take a trolley from DC to Alexandria and it would cross uh, on the old aqueduct, which was now a, a bridge going across the Potomac. And um, this continued until 1923 when the key bridge was built. And then that's when they removed the remains of the aqueduct. Uh, they left only the abutments, which you can still see in the river. Now, the picture on the right, that is a remnant of the Alexandria Canal, one of their locks that had, has been incorporated into the architecture of that office building there. I actually did a class there years ago before I even really knew what the CNO Canal was. And, um, you know, I, I saw that um, and I was like, what the, what the heck is this? I mean, it was nice to walk out, sit near the water, but I thought it was really odd looking and I couldn't figure out why there were the lock doors at the one end. I'm like, why would they need that? But, uh, you know, now I see that this is just a remnant of that old Alexandria Canal that they kept as a memento uh, in the courtyard of those two office buildings. Now, the th oh, and here is the aqueduct uh, with a boat going into it to cross the Potomac. Well, this one... I'm, I'm pretty sure this is going 
to the Alexandria side. Um, I believe that the lockhouse was on the CNO Canal. So this boat is leaving the CNO to go to Georgetown or to go to Alexandria. But um, so at that point, at this lockhouse, canal captains and canal boats had to make a decision. Man, my tongue tied. To make a decision, were they going to go to Georgetown or over to Alexandria? And with the canal boats, particularly in those early years, unloading them took a while. Uh, they could carry 120 tons of coal, had to be all kind of shoveled into buckets and lifted out uh, by cranes and things. So it wasn't a very mechanized operation. So a lot of labor. And the boats tended to back up a lot at Georgetown. So this was also one way for... Uh, you know, if a canal boat captain was anxious to um, offload and get back up to, to Cumberland and get a new load as quickly as he could, he might consider going off and offloading in Alexandria as opposed to Georgetown. Okay, so, oh. so the third one, I don't have a picture of it because it was never built, but um, it is called the Baltimore Crosscut Canal. This one dates back to that early convention uh, of internal promotion uh, that I talked about earlier. Um, as Maryland, even though Maryland had the railroad, of course, they, they still decided they wanted to tap into uh, the canal, uh, which was on their land going up along the Potomac. So they had three surveys made of possible routes that could go from Baltimore to uh, tie into the CNO Canal. And these routes, uh, they were done by uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, and you can still get their reports and see uh, all the problems that they ran into. But the three routes were called the Westminster Route, the Bonacasi Ligonor route and the Seneca route. They were all surveyed, they were all found impracticable for the sole reason that they just did not see them being able to keep enough water flowing through them. Coming across Maryland as they needed to, they weren't going to be paralleling a river uh, that would be able to provide a consistent flow to them. They were having to, they would be having to tap into creeks that they would be crossing and things like that and they just didn't think it would work. Um, there was a fourth route that the, um, that the colonel who did the surveying saw or considered while he was looking at the three proposed routes. Uh, this route would have gone um, from the Seneca River to the Patapsco River via Brookville. And it was thought that was at least feasible but it would cost $11.6 million to get that route even from Baltimore to connect with the CNO Canal in Frederick. Um, so eventually they decided that that price tag was just too much for them and uh, let it go by the wayside. One historian wrote of this canal, he said, the Maryland Crosscut Canal became the most studied canal never to be constructed in the US. I mean, it was looked at before the CNO Canal was built and then after, and they, they tried, they tried their best to make it happen. They just could not. Now the, um, once the Civil War started, Abraham Lincoln was kind of heavy handed with Maryland, um, needing to keep them in the Union since that was essentially where Washington, D.C. was. Uh, he didn't want them to vote themselves out of the Union and have the U.S. Capitol in the Confederate States. So he became, uh, you know, he, he went around, he imprisoned Maryland politicians who were known Confederate sympathizers so that when they finally did take a vote, uh, any existing sympathizers were either too scared to vote against uh, secession or they just weren't there to vote.
So, uh, and he was able to keep them in the union because of that. Now, this also caused some issues for the CNO Canal president, um, Alfred Spates. It's not known whether he was truly a sympathizer or just a businessman trying to keep on the good side of both uh, Union and Confederate, but he ran into multiple problems with the US government um, for his things he said, for, for his views. Um, so uh, definitely this guy, uh, this is not him. This is, uh, this is one of the Maryland politicians that was arrested a known Confederate sympathizer, um, Thomas McKay. Um, but uh, with Spates, he was the earliest known example probably of don't ask, don't tell, because if he had kept his mouth shut, he would have been all right. But he tended to talk a lot about what he was doing and he talked to the wrong people. The first time he ran into uh, problems was um, right after, let's see, yeah, it, right after the Battle of Antietam in September of 62, uh, he was actually um, arrested and questioned by the Provost General's office because of things he'd been saying about uh, how he'd gotten into Hagerstown during the battle. Then the following year, um, in the wake of the Battle of Gettysburg, he was actually caught in Hagerstown as the Union Army came through and controlled it for a while. Or excuse me, as the Confederate Army came through and controlled it for a while. So he, being a businessman, he took advantage of the opportunity. Um, he had to, uh, he contacted General Lee to get a pass to go into the Confederate uh, camp and speak with General Yule. Uh, and his discussion was about, you know, who's gonna pay for the damage you guys are doing to the canal as you cross it? And can you not do that kind of damage? Can, you know, if you're gonna cross it, you know, don't tear up the locks, don't tear up the, the, the canal doors or the lock doors, you know, things like that. It was very business-like discussion. Um, but then, in September of that year, 1863, he was talking about that discussion he'd had with some other business people. And one of them, who was actually the treasurer of the canal company, uh, reported that conversation to the provost general's office. And they came and questioned him. And uh, they, re they released him after that. Uh, but then he wrote a letter kind of just following up, asserting his innocence and in all this. And so they came back and arrested him again and charged him this time. Now, by the way, the, the belief is that the treasurer uh, had turned in his boss simply because he wanted to become the president of the canal company. But uh, so Spates was arrested. He was actually tried before a military tribunal uh, it lasted three weeks, and then the tribunal found him guilty of crossing Confederate lines and communicating with the enemy. Um, now, he was found not guilty of giving aid and intelligence to the enemy, which is good. However, that one guilty charge he did get was enough to have him tossed in prison for the rest of the war. He was sentenced to uh, serve time at Fort Warren at Boston Harbor. So they sent him up there, put him in the prison. Now he did make an appeal to the Assistant Secretary of War, Peter Watson, and uh, to try and, you know, to get Watson to plead his case to Secretary of War Stanton, and it worked. He was eventually released after being in prison for about two months. And he returned and took over as president of the Canal Company, I would also assume he fired the treasurer. Um, but, uh, and then following his time as Canal Company president, he went on to be president of the Cumberland Bank and even served as a Maryland senator uh, after the war. <laughs>
So yeah, be careful what you say. You don't know who's listening. I mentioned a little bit ago about how things could get backed up at Georgetown. Here's a picture of, of uh, the boats as they're starting to back up, waiting to be offloaded. One of, I'll call it the greatest tragedy that I've seen that happened on the canal involved a family of canalers, uh, the Spongs, S-P-O-N-G. And, um, you know, the, the whole family lived on the boat. It was one of those uh, boats where it was run by a family. So Samuel Spong, he brought his boat in to Georgetown early, early in the morning um, on September 11th, 1916. Now his boat was a numbered boat. It was number 74. Uh, by that time, the canal towage company had pretty much taken over the operation. They did a lot of um, making everything uniform, including making all the boats numbered instead of having individual names. So um, Samuel and his oldest son, Thomas, uh, once the boat was tore, uh, towed and tied up near uh, a seawall near the Capital Traction Power Company, uh, Samuel and Thomas brought the mules aboard. They took them to the mule shed. They were grooming them. Uh, this is around 5.30 in the morning now. So they're still going to have to wait to offload. So as things, as people start to wake up, get moving around, Nina Spong, the mom, uh, she gets up, she starts to prepare breakfast in the kitchen. There are three other children, uh, John, 13, Willard, 11, and Sarah, 6. They were all still asleep. Uh, they didn't need to get up yet. Well, they were parked near a place where this steam pipe came out of the seawall and then turned to go down into the river so that every morning the traction company would let uh, steam out from the company and that's the route it would travel through and be released into the river. No, nothing harmed, or at least no people harmed. Fish probably got a bit parboiled. Um, so this one particular morning, the traction company, uh, the superintendent, uh, the night shift goes down, turns the knobs to release the steam. It shoots out the uh, pipe and that turn, that elbow in the pipe gave way. And so essentially all that steam from this traction company shot right into the family cabin. People started screaming. I mean, these kids were asleep. All of a sudden they're being steamed to death. They start screaming. Nina starts screaming. Thomas and Samuel hear the screams. They run uh, out of the mule shed. Uh, they see what's happening. Um, Nina runs out because she'd been awake. So she could, you know, she just was right there by the door. She's out. Um, Samuel tries to run in uh, for his kids. Uh, he gets badly scalded across his back. They have to pull him out. Thomas somehow is able to get in and pull his siblings out. So they rush them all to the hospital uh, and they all, um, within a day, the three children had died. Uh, it had just been too much. They had literally been cooked to death. Uh, Nina and um, Samuel, they were treated for their wounds. Um, Nina's were severe, but not uh, life-threatening. Samuel's were uh, severe, but, you know, he just could be treated and released. And Thomas, surprisingly, did not have much happen uh, as far as wounds. He, he was surprisingly... Uh, unscalded. So this triggered an investigation with the um, coroner. Uh, he started interviewing people, investigating the scene. They determined that the, the elbow had, had been corroded a bit, so it had been weakened. And although 
every morning the traction company would let the steam through the pipe. It was designed to only release the steam of one turbine at a time. And there were three turbines. And for some reason, the guy, the night shift superintendent, he'd, he'd messed up. He'd pumped out the steam of two turbines at once. And that corroded elbow could not handle the pressure. And they determined that's what led to the, the collapse of the elbow and the eventual death of the children. So what was weird was the following year, the traction company paid the Spongs $5,000 uh, in total damages from that incident which is only about $105,000 today. So they, they awarded $1,500 for the death of two of the children, $1,000 for the third child's death, and $1,000 for Nina's injuries. Just sounds very, they got off really easy, um, which is quite surprising. But um, John, took the bodies of his children back to Keedysville on the train, uh, not the canal. And they were buried on September 13th at Mountain View Cemetery. Uh, there, uh, it's actually in Sharpsburg. And the Hagerstown Daily Mail said, quote, it was the most, most pathetic scene when the three little coffins were lowered into the graves. The funeral was exceptionally large Hundreds of residents of the community witnessing the burial could not control their feelings and were forced to give vent to sorrow. So although Samuel was able to attend the funeral, Nina was still um, in the hospital at the time because of her injuries, she could not attend. Um, and Samuel, uh, I mean, this ended his time on the canal. He was never, never able to bring himself to travel on the CNO Canal again. So I just, I consider it biggest tragedy I've ever read about on the canal. Oops. So this, this is probably my favorite story um, that I'll tell you now. And I call this one, how I solved five murders on the CNO canal that never happened. So canalers coming through the Paw Paw Tunnel um, on the east side one morning in the late 1890s were surprised when they saw that the canal house at lock 64 and two thirds was burned to the ground. And they investigated, they found that the lock keeper, who was a nice guy that most people like, um, was dead and that he had been robbed, that his collection of unusual coins that the canalers actually brought to him uh, had gone missing. So uh, they never did, uh, well, at the time, they did not find or know who had done this or why. They assumed it was robbery. So according to George Hooper Wolf in his book, I Drove Mules on the CNO Canal, um, they did discover that the lock keeper had, uh, had, was dead of burns and his skull had been crushed, that he'd been murdered. But the area was pretty isolated. I mean, it's down there. I don't know how many of you have been uh, between Paw Paw and Old Town. It's pretty empty or at least empty of people. Um, so they had to send somebody to Paw Paw, West Virginia, which was the closest location. Uh, nearest town, um, about a little over a mile away at that point. And they telegraphed to Cumberland to have the sheriff come down because the block was in Allegheny County. And uh, the, um, they also sent the coroner down to investigate. Now, months later, canalers who still remembered that, you know, they'd lost a friend with this murdered lock keeper, noticed in this one bar in Shantytown in Cumberland 
that there was somebody buying drinks and he was using coins that they recognized as having given to the lock keeper who was killed. And Hooper uh, or Wolf wrote that uh, once they realized that they nearly killed this guy because they decided that they realized that he was the murderer and that um, instead the police were able to step in and take him into custody and he was later hung for his crimes. The problem with that story is they don't think it's real. Um, and even when I researched it, I couldn't find a lot of corroborating information, in part because Wolf didn't have a lot of things you could like research. There were no names. There were uh, just that decade of the 1890s. Um, and when I even looked for hangings or, um, you know, trials in the late 1890s uh, involving murder, I wasn't able to find anything. So uh, as I researched, I ran across the fact that the Canal Park Rangers, they don't believe this story. In fact, one of them said that if he could, he would burn every copy of Hooper Wolf's book in existence because it's, an, it's, a, it's essentially an oral history and it was written by a man who um, was 75 at the time uh, in 1969, recalling his time on the canal in the early 1900s. And so a lot of factual problems they had found had crept into his recall. So the canal rangers, they said, I needed to look there was a murder that happened on the canal and I needed to look at this murder. So I did, they, um, they directed me to uh, Thomas Hahn's book, uh, the Towpath Guide, which mentioned that a lock keeper named Joe Davis and his wife were murdered by being shot uh, along the canal um, on, in 1934. And so I started researching that. Davis took care of lock 61 during the last couple decades of the canal's operation. And um, Han also wrote that the bodies of Davis and his wife were burned after the murder to try and cover up the crime. So that caught my attention. Um, so now I've got burnings at both, in both stories to cover up murders. And the two lock houses were actually only about a mile and a half apart. So I'm like, what are the odds? that um, that could have happened or that they could not be connected. So I started looking into that. And once I did, I found a story in the um, Morning Herald in Hagerstown uh, from April 5th, 1930. And the headline is, Two Believe Burned in Allegheny County Home. Foul play is hinted at after skulls found. Mystery marks home burning and disappearance at Kiefer. This headline, even more so than the story itself, became an urban legend. That is what led to um, Hooper Wolf's uh, or George Wolf's story. It's what led to Thomas Hahn's story, neither of which is fully accurate or fully tells the story. But the story in the Herald Mail was about Joseph Davis. And um, he and his wife were killed in a fire on August 4th. Uh, they were found laying on the bed springs of their bed in the basement of the house that had burned down. And it was reported that the fire had been so hot that it had warped the metal fixtures on the doors and things like that. Um, however, uh, it was also reported that, um, you know, they were found in the basement because the floor had also collapsed and they had fallen in there. But what it turns out when you dig into it and when you actually read the stories and the follow-up stories is that the state's attorney in Allegheny County had never really considered it murder, even though there were some rumors. Uh, they had quickly ruled that out. They 
the belief is that Joe Davis had fallen asleep smoking and his uh, pipe, cigarette, whatever, had caught the mattress on fire and started the fire, which killed him and his wife. Now, there are also reports of uh, bullets being found at this site of this um, fire, which led to the belief that it had been murder. But they determined that, uh, yeah, the bullets were found there, but it was because he had a weapon. You know, everybody back then had weapons, but the heat had set off his ammunition, and that's what they were finding. The belief that they had been robbed came from the fact that um, while the, sto the stories of the Park Service and Hooper Wolf's story of being robbed came from the fact, as far as I can tell, that they found melted metal, gold and silver, that was later determined to be coins that had melted. So the assumption had been at first that they'd been murdered or for their money, but actually their money had just melted. Now, if that wasn't enough, after I wrote about all this, uh, Karen Gray, who was a volunteer with the uh, CNO Canal, she started checking the stuff that I had, you know, checking on my sources and things like that to add to the Canal Library. And she wrote me about another murder that she had found uh, while she was doing this. This one was in 1900. A man named William McCulley lived along the canal near the eastern end of the Paw Paw Tunnel. Um, now, he was not a lock keeper, he was a merchant, but the Cumberland Evening Times wrote in 1903 that, um, and, they, and they were recalling something that had happened in 1900 at this point, that McCulley, who had just died in 03, uh, there'd been this incident at his store where he and his wife um, had been attacked by a gang of robbers who came into the store, robbed them, tied them up with a uh, rope. Um, they actually had to kind of burn their soles of their feet to get them to tell where their money had been hidden. And apparently uh, the couple was found the next morning. Uh, they were alive. It was thought they would die because uh, they'd been beaten and treated so badly. Um, McCulley uh, did recover. His wife never fully recovered. She died a few weeks later. So there are elements of that story, the robbery, the location, um, you know, essentially a near murder that all tie in. So all four of these stories all contributed something to what has become an urban legend. And even though the canal rangers don't like what Hooper Wolf says in his book, the story they're telling, I still don't know if they're still telling it. Uh, they were a few years ago still telling the story of Joe Davis as being a murdered lock keeper. So they're still not getting it right. But, uh, you know, when it's this confusing with all these different stories being part of it, uh, not too surprising. But, you know, I kind of hopefully have unraveled it now. And so I have solved all these murders that never happened. <laughs> so after the canal closed uh, and kind of fell into disrepair, here's a shot of it uh, running through Georgetown. So by 1950, or actually uh, it was in 1850 when the canal reached Cumberland, the canal directors had still wanted to forge ahead from Cumberland. They still talked about it, um, you know, taking the canal up to the headwaters of the Ohio. And of course it never happened. It, the canal was never super profitable, uh, except really during the 1870s. Um, so it kind of fell by the wayside. Now the canal closed in 1924, fell into disrepair like you're seeing in this picture. Um, but the, the idea started circulating that perhaps they needed to take another look 
at making the Potomac River navigable and finding a way to have river transportation going out to Pittsburgh. And so the Army Corps of Engineers was brought in and they looked at a way to um, create a canal or at least a partial canal, sort of like along the idea of uh, Washington's Potomac Company to make the river navigable, to get it up to um, Pittsburgh and then be able to go to the Ohio River. The big feature of their plan was they wanted to blast a big tunnel through a mountain. I mean, it would have been multiple times longer than the Pawpaw Tunnel, which is five eighths of a mile long. Um, but that was the way they saw they could do it. Um, you know, you can certainly dredge the river uh, and make it deeper for heavier boats. I still don't know how they plan to get around the Great Falls, um, but they, you know, they never mentioned that as being a problem in their reports. Uh, and they were just pretty much from Cumberland. Uh, they would blast through the mountain, have this big, long tunnel going through. And of course, big dreams like that got people excited. They started seeing all the benefits, uh, things like um, the power that would be generated off the, the water, the um, because they would have to have dams to impound water along the, uh, along the river. And those dams could be used to generate some turbines and create some uh, hydroelectric power. Of course, there was the commerce that they were seeing that would be created. Uh, and uh, the particularly once they started, once it had like the, the approval or the seal of the Army Corps of Engineers that it was feasible, people in Western Pennsylvania, they started getting excited about it. Uh, the construction cost was estimated at $60 million, which would be about uh, $1.1 billion today. Um, and it would have had a nine foot channel uh, going through the mountains west of Cumberland, which is not really they should have known better right off the bat because a nine foot channel is not much of um, a passage for a canal boat. Uh, they ran into problems with the CNO canal, which is about 12 feet wide most places. So nine foot uh, really would have been limiting uh, what, they, what they could do. But um, you know, they, the talk was all strong for months in the newspapers. Um, planning out the routes that they would take. Uh, and then in 1938, the Park Service got control of the CNO Canal and its uh, rights away. And they announced that they, um, they were going to have a parkway built on the canal uh, along the towpath. And that kind of took the wind out of the sails of the this new canal project because this was making a highway uh, would be a lot cheaper and um, and so that was the plan actually until 1954 when uh, Supreme Court Justice Douglas made his walk along the canal and made the pitch to preserve it as a national park uh, so we didn't get the, this big tunnel through the mountains and we also didn't get a parkway along the towpath, but um, that's where it started. Hold on, yes, ma'am. This is all one way because it's not wide enough to- Yeah, that nine foot thing would have been, they would have had, it would have been, they would have had to have planned it like they do railroads because you can only have one train going one direction on the railroad. So they would have had to have points where canal boats waited to, you know, so much any, you know, one way traffic came through before they allowed. Now the CNO canal, at least they were able to have, they could, boats could pass and it was kind of semi-complicated to do it, but they, you know, they had a plan and it worked for canal boats to pass each other, except for instance, 
at the Paul Paul Tunnel. And they ran it even with the Paul Paul Tunnel. They ran into problems there because if a canal boat captain wasn't paying attention to the light on the on that was showing on the other canal boats, because they put a, a red light on the front of the boat, a green light on the back, so canal boat captain coming could see. If he saw a green light in the tunnel, he knew he could continue on. If he saw a red light, he knew that was a boat coming. Well, sometimes those impatient captains tried to rush in thinking they could intimidate the other boat, but there were also rules for who had right away. But you would run into problems with boats meeting in the tunnel and, you know, and then continuing to back up because, you know, these two boats meet in the middle of the tunnel while the captains are arguing, other boats are coming along, they're seeing a green light, they're coming into the tunnel, you know, so. When they're motorized. Hmm? They weren't motorized, right? They were all towed by, by mules, correct? They, until the end of the canal, the CNO canal. Now, there was a time they tried motorizing the canal boats. It was kind of controversial. The canal, the Park Service will tell you it was because uh, they couldn't use it because the uh, engines damaged the canal beds uh, and create, created too much of a sloshing effect and all. But the actual test when they were running it did not show that. So I'm not sure where that belief came from. Other canals used, uh, you know, steam engines to run their boats in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But for whatever reason, they didn't want it happening on the CNO canal. There was that belief that it would damage it, uh, which was not founded in fact. How far down did the... Wait, 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 one second. We're, we're lacking our... Oh. our I have to repeat today. questions. Normally, you know, the Dave Kirk sitting over there, Manning, Trolls, and Gina here. So we need, we don't have the sound, the church's sound system. So we need to repeat the questions uh, okay. when you're asked. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to go into QA now or do you want to? I got one more story. Okay. Why don't you tell, well, before you do that, well, why don't we take our, the moment you've been waiting for now, passing the hat. <laughs> <laughs> this is, as you know, we don't charge admission to these lectures, uh, and the way we can get away with that is we pass the hat and we find that people are generous in emptying out their pockets and their wallets and putting it in the basket. So Mike and Nancy will pass that. Uh, we have a question from the chat. Room. Well, let, let's wait till I finish this oh, last story and sorry. then I'll take all the questions. Okay. okay, so my, my last story I wanted to tell you, I hope it's my last story. Actually, no, I'm going to skip this one and I'll make this one my last story. So um, there are, you would think a canal that was around for, since it broke ground in 1826, that all that was to be known about it would be known. And they're still finding out questions, mysteries about it, I guess you'd call them. Things that are, don't make sense. Um, and that's because nowadays you've got a lot of, uh, like the CNO Canal Association is transcribing a lot of documents, putting them online um, for researchers to look at, uh, scanning them, putting the, you know, the originals online. And so researchers are looking through them and finding things don't add up with the CNO Canal in certain areas. For instance, one of the big beliefs about the CNO Canal is that a lot of the um, canal boats were operated by families, like the Spong family. So yes, there were definitely families that operated canal boats. But when you look apparently at the mortgages of these canal boats, a lot of the mortgages, the banks weren't dummies. They wanted to be able to get their money back. So they required that these boats run essentially 24-7, which researchers have said, you know, family operations with pretty much just, you know, say the father, maybe an older kid and the wife uh, working the boat, they would not have been able to run a 24-7 operation. So they're pretty sure that 
Um, a lot of the early boat operations were done by paid captains with crews. It wasn't until the canal towage company came and took over things, made things uniform. Uh, and also because by then the traffic on the canal had slowed down so much that they could, even if they had wanted to operate 24 seven, they really couldn't, that it became more conducive for family operations. And though that operation from the last couple of decades is what has stuck in the memories of people who've talked about the canal. Uh, another thing they um, realized was that before the canal had fully opened at Cumberland, uh, as they would hit the outlet locks at the dams, they would open the operation of the canal from that point further down. And so they just kept opening it in sections. So at one point you had this in between time where you had part of the canal open, you didn't have any rules on the type of boats that could use the canal and canal boats as they're designed were not river boats. They would not work in river operation. Uh, but what they were using for river operation uh, prior to the canal opening were flat boats that were pulled. You know, so, you know, they weren't big, but um, they could load cargo on it and then pull them down the river. They didn't draw a lot of water so they could handle the low water levels of the Potomac. And then when they got to the canal or to the canal inlet box, they could go into the canal and then travel with ease down to Georgetown. But then they realized that those flat boats could not operate on the CNO canal um, because of the poles. They needed poles to kind of move along and the poles would definitely have damaged the clay berm by essentially poking holes in it. So they know the flat boats could not have operated on the canal, canal boats could not have operated on the river. So the question is what kind of boat was going uh, from Cumberland to Georgetown before the canal fully opened. Uh, they think perhaps what happened was the flat boats uh, hired mules to pull them once they were in the canal, but they can't find any evidence of that yet. For instance, somebody renting mules to canalers at Williamsport. Uh, so they're still trying to figure that one out. The one I like the big mystery I like is that canal boats for decades, they've said canal boats were 92 foot long, 14 foot wide. So they would just fit into a lock. And because they were kind of a tight fit in a lock, you know, there wasn't a lot of, uh, as the water rises and lowers, they're so close to the sides that they can't be really thrown up against the sides to damage the lock walls or the gates. And, you know, that makes sense, except they have found there are multiple locks on the canal that can't hold a boat that long. They, some of them can only hold a boat that would be 85 foot long. So how is it that canal boats were supposedly 92 feet long? Uh, and, you know, they would not have fit into the locks. They could not have traveled the canals. They're still trying to figure that one out. Um, one thing they've suggested is that those original specs were based on an old canal boat that had been out of the water for a while. And perhaps, you know, the wood had expanded as it dried out. Um, but, you know, seven feet long, uh, that's somewhat unlikely. So yeah, that's still another mystery that they're still trying to figure out. So, you know, the canal may be almost 200 years old now, but there's still some mysteries that they're trying to solve and still some secrets that it is still holding on to. So there we go. Uh, thanks for having me out and I'll take questions now. <laughs>
Do you want to do the ones in the chat yeah, first? Yeah, there's time I have here. Um, I think they can probably hear me. George Washington died in 1799, but his canal company failed by 1810. Who was the owner or owners after his death? And did his death cause the failure, or as you say, that the canal plan was not feasible? His company uh, had directors and officers, so it fell to the next in line. Offhand, I do not know his name, uh, but it did fail because it really wasn't feasible. Um, it was a series, it wasn't really a canal that he had proposed and built. It was a series of locks to get around the rough sections, say like Great Falls. But they still had to deal with the, um, you couldn't depend on the level of the Potomac River. So you would still have problems bringing cargo down even though you could get around, say, the rapids at um, Harper's Ferry or uh, Great Falls, if you were kind of in a dry season, you were going to have trouble because a boat would not be able to, to come down the river, even in the navigable portion. So that was really what kind of ended the canal. They, they realized, or the canal company, Potomac Company, they realized they needed something more dependable. Okay, so uh, he asked, where are the canals on the Virginia side? Yeah, Washington's Potomac Company locks were on the Virginia side. Uh, Virginia actually has a Great Falls uh, State Park. So if you go out to um, the Great Falls Overlook at the, um, uh, the tavern, Great, uh, Great Falls Tavern, uh, and you look across the river, you can, you'll can you be looking into the Great Falls um, State Park over there, and you will also see the remnants of one of the locks that Washington built on that side. Yeah, Washington was a Virginian, so he was doing all his stuff for the benefit of Virginia. So all the locks he built uh, were on the Virginia side. And that was why I was talking about at the beginning, Maryland and Virginia needed to work things out because they were going to be doing construction in the river, uh, building dams to impound water through the docks, things like that. But it was land owned by Grant by, to Maryland. If it had all been in the Maryland side, it would have been no issue. Yes, sir. Percentage of uh, cowboys, they sold them off. I thought a certain number came down that never turned back up. What percentage of canal boats were sold off by for lumber? None. The flat boats that I mentioned at the end, they were. They were flimsily constructed, uh, essentially a one-way, made for one-way passage. They came down, sold the cargo, sold the lumber. The canal boats were a big investment for the family. And they had to take out mortgages on those canal boats. Um, they took a while to build. They were sturdy, made of Georgia pine. Uh, so, yeah, they were made for multiple trips. But what they did, it was the flat boats that did not return. Oh. Yes, sir. Okay. So were the mules owned by the canal boat um, or the people who own the canal boat? Yes, for the most part. Um, now, there would be, certainly, there's going to be exceptions to the rule uh, where you would have renting them. But the problem was that canal mules, they were pretty specialized. They had to be trained to pull that load. And so it was also part of an investment. Now, there would be people who would rent them out. And of course, if you had boats owned by a company, they would provide the mules as well. The CNO Canal Towage Company, which took over, essentially took over the canal and all its operations in the 20th century, they provided canal boats and canal mules to their captains, uh, which were family operations at that time. So um, it did cut, it, there was actually a benefit when they did that because it cut down on some of the expenses that 
uh, a family had to incur. They just had to worry about feeding the mule. They didn't have to buy it and have to pay for it because they were also expensive because you bought them trained and broken to be able to pull. So yeah, so for the most part, you know, 99% of the mules were gonna be owned by the people who owned the boat. Now they would winter them with farmers, uh, you know, and uh, so then they would have to pay the farmers to put them up for the winter, but the farmers didn't own them even though they had possession of them. And then they'd come back in the spring to pick up their mules and have to, they usually had to fatten them back up because the, the farmers didn't take great care of them. What was the cost of a canal? Cost of a canal boat. If I remember right, Initially, the number I've heard, I think it was $500, which was a big amount in those days. If I'm, I think I'm remembering that right. What would they be now? Well, um, so if, if 5,000 in 1916 is 105 today, so 500, so in 1828, Probably, yeah, probably the cost of a house, you know, maybe what a quarter mil today, something along that line. You'd have to, it depends on what year you're talking, buying it. Um, you know, if you have a specific year, there's actually a, a inflation calculator online. You can figure out uh, how much something, you know, in 1828 is worth today. So, yes, ma'am. Tell me about seasonal traffic. You know, the windows were much harder than what they are now. So the water had to, had to freeze. What did they do? Did they just stop transporting? Well, it all depended on how bad, oh, uh, seasonal traffic on the canal. Uh, it all depended on how bad the winter was. There were boats that were equipped to be icebreakers. So they would, um, so the canal company in the 1800s you know, as it started to, as the mornings would start to freeze over, you know, they would, they would send these canal icebreakers up and down to try and keep the canal open as long as they could. Often there would come a time where they would have to close it down and drain it for a couple months. Uh, usually December through February would be um, the close down period. But, it, you know, if it was a warm winter, they would keep it open because that's how they would generate their income. Now, once they did close it down and drain it, uh, that's when they would also do a lot of their repairs on the canal beds and the lock doors and things like that. So they didn't let that it sit idle per se. You know, that was they used that time to to get it ready for the next season. Well, I was just thinking since we're turned on the animals pudding. But the animals, you know, it wouldn't be secure. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was just a dirt path. The towpath was a dirt path. Well, uh, I haven't heard about anything about the footing because those mules, they, I mean, they would dig in. They knew how to do it. But, um, uh, you know, and I guess they would probably, the canalers themselves would know they wanted to keep the towpath as free of puddles and things as they could. Um, but yeah, the, the big problem was the ice in the canal. And if it got too thick for the icebreakers, then that's when they would have to shut it down. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so I want to and uh, I just want to add a little respect because the canal. You should dance. If you're going to should come up here so people can hear. <clears throat> Where? Here? Yeah. 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 Much. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, the canal, you know, as as Jim said, was a real. Uh, project of George Washington's, right? And when it failed, the 
And one reason it was, there's a great book by a guy named Aschenbach from the Post, was he was more concerned about a division of the country north and uh, east and west than he was north and south. He wanted to connect those western counties to the east coast because there were empires out there that he thought they might break off and uh, we would lose a continental republic. That was the direction the country was expanded. He wanted to follow Yeah, it. he wanted to follow it. He wanted to be what unity of the country was a major concern of his, you know, in addition to making some money, of course. But the, uh, when it was, when that failed, um, the person, Matt Mercer, whom he mentioned here from Virginia, was actually a Federalist who knew Washington's family and was absolutely determined that he was realizing Washington's vision with building the CNO Canal. So, and again, it was a question of trying to get, which you also mentioned, federal government support. So in 1823, they actually got Monroe to agree that there were the Corps of Engineers would survey for the canal and then they would go ahead and they had the private company with, but it also had contributions from the federal government, the second bank of the United States and also, you know, state governments and so forth and so on. So, I mean, the way I think about this canal is really as a national unity project and its historical importance, you know, goes along with that as well as its local side. And so thank you. Yes, ma'am. About how did they go about building these canals? And did they import workers, Chinese, for instance, or slaves? So how did they go about building the canals and did they import workers? So once they had, as she mentioned, you know, they surveyed the route. So they know, knew their route. So they let out contracts for sections of the canal. So you would have multiple companies digging um, by hand, by um, mule pool dredge, digging these giant trenches. And because it was surveyed out, they knew, you know, they would meet up. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, with the inlet locks and all, once they hit an inlet lock, they could flood the canal from that point down and start operation along it. So there's, you know, half a dozen dams uh, that uh, not as many anymore, but there used to be dams along the river and that would impound the water that they would have flow into the canal and that provided a consistent water level. So once these various contracts hooked up with their sections and they go to that lock, open it up, and then the water starts flowing. As far as labor, they did import labor, essentially, even though they weren't technically indentured servants, that's really what they were. The company was advertising, uh, particularly in, um, in the UK, where there were really well-known or well-respected stonemasons, uh, pitching for them, uh, making grand promises, paying for their passage, but then they get over here and they're pretty much getting low pay, promises aren't being fulfilled. Um, so it was rough. Um, they would hire locally if they could. And there were slaves known to have worked on the canal depending on um, you know, which contractor. It wasn't something that was endorsed by the company itself, but because all these sections of the canal were done by various companies who had bid for them, if that particular company um, had slaves or made arrangements to have slaves, and they know a few of them did, there were slaves that were known to have worked on the canal. So, and also seasonal. Farmers would probably come. yeah, see, uh, some of the farmers would do it, but and labor really became a big issue. Uh, certainly, the further west they pushed, it was harder to find local labor, so they depended more on those indentured. Uh, types of uh, servants. But the other problem they ran into with the B&O Railroad building same time in roughly the same location, 
they were poaching each other's workers, even though they were supposed to be under contract. You know, they, if the railroad needed more workers, they'd go over and make big promises to the canal group and, you know, pull some of them over and vice versa. And then of course you had the, um, the because some of the imported labor was also German, you had a lot of Protestant versus Catholic uh, problems on the canal, caused some revolts. Uh, or I guess riots would be the better word between the two groups. If, you know, if a group met up with the other group and words could start flying and fists and of course then tools get involved. So uh, they, they had some issues because of that. There are some uh, canal cemeteries that are filled with, you know, either workers who killed each other or uh, workers who died from say cholera epidemics, which they did have and other diseases. Yes, sir. Was Casper Weaver considered the principal architect? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say principal architect. I mean, he's, he's definitely gets credit. He's involved. But there are a lot of other fingers in the pie. So I'm not sure, I, I definitely, I don't think I would consider him principal, a major one, but not principal. Somebody else might, uh, depending on how they looked at it or you know, what weight they give uh, various contributions. Okay. Yes, sir. Were segments of it used for recreation? Yes, they used to have almost, uh, I mean, they, they would take groups out to, you know, for picnics, uh, you know, so they had those, those more casual type of uh, canal boat trips. Um, and it would certainly have been easier to do up on the Western end where traffic didn't back up as much. So you could move a boat around. You wouldn't want to have tried that down in the Georgetown area because of the congestion and a, um, you know, party boat, say, would have just added to that congestion. But they, they are known to have taken groups out um, to just, you know, to do country outings, you know, take them down the river a little bit. Um, when Coxey's army came through uh, Western Maryland, in the 1890s, they were running behind schedule. They rented a couple boats, took their group from Cumberland down to Williamsport on canal boat. Uh, so that wasn't necessarily recreational, but it was still more, uh, it wasn't transporting cargo unless you consider it un human cargo. So yeah, it was, it was used quite often. And there were, um, in those cases, you could also get away with using a smaller boat. Okay, so those are called wide water locks. So the wide water locks are the ones that open to the river, and their purpose was uh, in locations where they're there just wasn't enough room for the canal to run through and a canal towpath that they had to open up to the river and kind of adjust for a short distance and bring them into these wide, wide water locks or open river locks and then bring them back in as soon as they could. Because again, you were kind of, once you're out in the river, you're a little bit more turbulent um, you're having to deal with the ups and downs of the river. So you didn't want to have to be out there too long. Uh, during the war, that was actually, those were actually spots where Confederate raiders who would capture canal boats would take them into the river and guide them across the river so they could get their cargo into the Confederate States. So they were used in that manner, but that wasn't why they were built. It was out of necessity. Once they were in the river, um, they would usually have an area still wide enough for a towpath. 
So you could still have mules pulling it along um, just on the, usually you had the mule on the, um, between the canal and the river. So now you're taking the canal boat out. So the mule's now on the other side of the boat, but it just pulls it until they can get back in. And then they take them, there was a crossover where the mules um, would go to be on the proper side. Um, and then as far as the Confederates, when they took them out in the river, they just kind of would guide it, let it drift and go down the river and just keep it guiding to the side, to the other side of the river. Yes, sir. So when the canal froze up in the winter, where did the boats go? Um, often they stayed there. They would, um, they would know, it. message would be sent up and down the canal um, that we're gonna close, we're gonna drain the canal on this date. So then it was up to the canalers to get their boat where they want it to be. Often they took their boats to Williamsport or Cumberland so that they, once the canal was drained, when it was ready to be refilled in the spring, they would be right there ready to pick up a load and head back down to DC. Um, but if you didn't get back in time, wherever the water ran out, that's where you were stuck until the water came back. Could the lock keepers communicate by telegraph? Um, some of them could. It was not uh, widely used on the canal, especially in the earliest decades. Um, once they did start running it, there was some communication, um, but it wasn't every lock house. It would have only been like major places. And even then, um, you know, I mean, it was, it was a big luxury back then. And then the lock keeper would have had to have been trained in Morse code. So, uh, so generally it would have been like, uh, so I bet you Great Falls would have had one. It was a major hub of activity. Um, you know, certainly the, uh, the lock houses at either end of the canal had uh, telegraphs. Uh, but, uh, you know, say like just your typical lock keeper, no, they would have gone right by them. Yes. Well, they, they, I mean, they did allow the, the, the families to remain in the lock houses after the canal closed. Uh, I mean, they really didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, I mean, they they didn't know, they just wanted to land. The, the government wanted to land, so they didn't have plans for it at first. Uh, so yeah, they stayed there. Um, heck, they even know of some families who, once the canal was finally drained and their boat is just sitting there in the canal, they stayed living on their canal boat for years um, because it was something they had that, you know, place they could stay, roof over their heads. Um, that's why with the canal quarters program that the canal has, where they've refurbished some of the lock houses to various decades of the canal, there is one from the 1950s. Uh, and that's because there were families still living in the canal houses or the lock houses in the 1950s. And so there's one to represent that. And then there's one way back to the 1820s. I'm told there's two other questions on line, but I don't see them in the chat room. Uh, okay, so um, first as both at Waynesport, Maryland, Walt Fair, the Chief Justice Walk, there the Great Walk Trail, short trip, Generally, I mean, it could vary. Now, one of the things I know from when they were running it 24 seven, um, it was said about four days um, 
Now, you could also wind up spending at least that much time in congestion at Georgetown, too. Uh, but if you were only, for instance, um, running it in like in the late eight, late years of the canal when it was family operated, they were pretty much just operating during the days. So then you're talking probably about a week to get to the um, from Cumberland to Georgetown. Okay, why don't we wrap it up? Okay. That was good. Good. <laughs> okay, so our next lecture will be on the third Sunday in April, April 16th, because Easter is the second Sunday. And as I said, that will be on the Robert E. Lee's Maryland campaign of 1862 and, and a reassessment of that by author Alex Rossino. That, of course, is the, is the campaign that ended in the, the Battle of Antietam or Sharpsburg. But of course, nobody knew that when the campaign started. So uh, the author will review some questions that have come up, assumptions that have been made that are being questioned, uh, and I think will be very interesting. So that will be April 16th. Hope to see you then. Thank you for coming out.